Hey everyone, I'm Ian Norman from Lonely Spec, and today I'm combining some new tools with advanced techniques to create some ultra high resolution, low noise astrophotos. Two of my favorite techniques for achieving higher image quality are exposure stacking and panorama stitching. This tutorial is about combining those two techniques for astrophotography. If you're not already familiar with exposure stacking or pano stitching, I recommend you save this video for later and watch these tutorials first. Medium format astrophotography with panorama stitching and either Milky Way exposure stacking with manual alignment in Photoshop or for Mac users, noise-free astrophotography with starry landscape stacker. Now that we're familiar with these two techniques, I'm gonna introduce a new tool that I've started using that makes both the stacking and stitching process cleaner and quicker. And that tool is a panorama head. I have a Sunway Photo DDP64SI, which is a simple horizontal panorama head that I've combined with a leveling base and a nodal slide. And that's what I'll be using for this tutorial. If you're shopping for a panorama head, I recommend choosing one that has a detent range that encompasses between 8 and 18 degrees. This will work best when shooting a panorama with a 35mm to 85mm lens on a full frame camera. Those are the focal lengths that I like best for this technique. Of course, you'll also need your standard astrophotography gear. I'll be using my Sony a7S, a 55mm lens, my tripod, and I'll be doing my post-processing in Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Lightroom. For this technique, I'm gonna set up my camera in a vertical position on my panorama head. To make panorama stitching easy, we want 50% horizontal overlap on the images that we capture. Using my 55 millimeter, I figured out that I need to set my panorama head to a detent of 12 degrees in order to achieve that overlap. Be sure to set your detent setting to achieve 50% overlap for the camera and lens that you're using. For this tutorial, we'll have two rows and five columns of photos for a total of 10 camera positions. We'll take four photos in each position for a total of 40 photos. You'll see here that with my panorama head, I've added a few things to my traditional setup. On my tripod, I've got a leveler below the panorama head, which makes setup faster and easier. I've also got a nodal slide attached to an Arca L bracket on my camera, which allows me to shift my camera backwards placing the lens directly above the rotation point. This reduces parallax when rotating the panorama head from side to side. Once I've set up my camera on the tripod, I level the panorama head first. Then I'm ready to focus and set my camera settings. Consistency is key with exposure stacking and panorama stitching, so you want to set all settings manually, including white balance. If you need tips on how to set your camera settings for astrophotography, check out my tutorial on how to photograph the Milky Way. For this tutorial, we'll be taking exposures in 10 camera positions, beginning with the top left and moving clockwise, so we'll be shooting the sky first. Frame your first shot, the top left position of your image, to include the horizon at the bottom of the frame. Rotate your camera across the full sweep of your sky row to make sure that all shots will fully include the horizon. The sky shouldn't touch the bottom of any of your frames. Take four exposures in position one, then move to position two, taking four exposures there, and so on until you've completed the row. Moving onto the ground, adjust your camera framing down to place the horizon at the top of the frame. Do a quick sweep to ensure all horizon elements are included in the framing of each shot, being sure not to cut off any mountain tops. And continue taking four exposures in each position until you've completed the row. At the end, you should have 40 images total. All right, so now that we've shot all of our photographs, I'm gonna go ahead and go over my example shots for this tutorial. So I have here my sets of four exposures of my panorama. So if we look really quickly at one of these exposures, uh, we'll just zoom in real quick just so I can show you what to expect. You can see that there's quite a bit of noise in here. I have all of my noise reduction disabled right now on this photograph. Um, there's definitely some color noise in the foreground and a whole bunch of noise in the sky as well. And this process that we're going to go through on these photographs is definitely going to help that uh, noise level. 
So the first thing that we're going to want to do is to be able to combine stacks of four exposures together at a time. So what I've done is I've exported uh, each set of these exposures into their own folder. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and export these just as an example. So, so selecting these four exposures, I can go over to my left-hand toolbar here and click Export. And just for this example, I'm exporting these photographs into a folder called my Alabama Hills Panorama Demo. And I'm going to put these in a subfolder called Sky1. And we want to make sure that we maintain all of our raw data in these photographs. So I'm going to make sure that I'm exporting as TIFF. And uh, I'll use Profoto RGB for my color space and 16 bits per component. Uh, everything else will... Uh, leave unchecked here, no resizing or sharpening, and then we can click export. And I'm going to basically do this for each set of four exposures and pull them into their own respective folders. So I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like. I have each set of my four exposures exported to their own respective folders here. So you can see that I have my four sky exposures for my sky position one, and then in Sky Position 2, I have four exposures exported there. And I have the same thing for all of my other positions of the panorama. So the next step after getting all of your exposures organized into their respective folders is to stack each one together. That's covered in my stacking tutorials, either Milky Way exposure stacking with manual alignment or noise-free astrophotography with Starry Landscape Stacker. For my demo here, I'm going to use Starry Landscape Stacker. So let's go ahead and pull up one of these folders in Starry Landscape Stacker. If you don't have a Mac computer and you're on a PC, definitely check out my Milky Way Exposure Stacking with Manual Alignment tutorial that shows you how to do it in Adobe Photoshop. I like to use Starry Landscape Stacker on my Mac. It's really fast. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you this one stack as an example. I'm going to start with my sky number two position, uh, just because I think this is a really great example. I select all of my exposures and then I can click open and Starry Landscape Stacker will automatically read and try to recognize the stars in our photograph. And as you can see, it did a pretty good job here. It highlighted everything in red. So it's found all of the stars in the photograph. And then we can move on by basically clicking find sky and Starry Landscape Stacker will automatically select the sky with, a, with this blue mask. So it knows where the sky is and where the ground is. I actually think this mask looks really, really good. Uh, so we can go ahead and just click Align and Save. Okay, so now it's created this composite TIFF file, and I'm going to go ahead and just save that composite TIFF file in this folder that I have reserved for composites, and go ahead and click Save. And just to show you an example of what the stacking does to the photograph, if we zoom in to 100% on this photo, and we compare our composite image to a single exposure, you can see the single exposure is pretty noisy, and the composite image has greatly reduced noise, a little bit better detail, and just overall smoother tones. Okay, so now that we have that saved, I'll go ahead and show you how I have my composites organized here. So I spent some time to stack together the four exposures for each position of the panorama, and I came out with this set of composite images. And all of these composites are basically ready to compile into a panorama. And I'm just going to run through that really quickly. I like to use Adobe Lightroom for this, but we can also use Adobe Photoshop or any other panorama software that you may prefer. So creating a panorama in Adobe Lightroom Classic is pretty straightforward. We can basically select all these photographs by clicking on the first one, holding down shift and clicking on the last one. And then we can right click on one of the photographs and go to photo merge and panorama. And then Lightroom Classic will automatically analyze and stitch together our photographs. And Lightroom gives us a couple different options for projection methods. It looks like if I use the spherical projection method, the aspect ratio is a little more natural. Um, let's see what perspective looks like. Perspective is a little bit more stretched, um, but more panorama-like. I'm not sure I like that that much. So I, I really think I like the spherical projection method, so that's what I'll stick with here. And that's basically it for Panorama Stitching in Lightroom Classic, so we can just click Merge. And Lightroom will automatically create a DNG file of the panorama. And the cool thing about that is that as a DNG, it's basically still maintaining the original bit depth of the raw file. So it should be able to be edited just like a raw file, editing white balance and exposure. 
Um, so you can do all of your standard edits that you would normally do on a single exposure. Now one thing that I want to address is an issue that you might run into when you try to merge your panorama together. Since there's a lot of extra time that we have to spend to take those exposures, there's more movement in the sky, and sometimes the stitch just won't work very well. So the solution to that that I've found is to basically stitch the sky and the ground separately. So in that case, we'd basically do the same thing, but instead we would select the ground stack and photo merge that separately from the sky stack. I'm going to do that really quickly. I'm going to go ahead and use the spherical projection method for this one. And then we can go ahead and move on to the sky stack, use photo merge and then panorama on the sky, and I'll also use the spherical projection method here. Go ahead and click merge. So after you have your sky and your ground panoramas merged, we can basically open those in Photoshop and do the combining manually. So to do that, I'll go ahead and select my ground panorama, hold down command and select my sky panorama. Then I can right click, go to edit in, and open as layers in Photoshop. And that'll automatically open them in Adobe Photoshop as layers so that we can easily combine them together. Okay, so we have both of these images in here, and uh, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna roughly drag into place where I think it should go. Uh, maybe to do that, an easy way to, to see uh, their alignment is just to reduce the opacity of one of the layers down to about 50%. And then, uh, and then I can sort of just drag it roughly into place. That's close enough for now. So I'll reset my opacity uh, just by dragging it back up. And once we have those roughly aligned, we can go ahead and expand our canvas really quickly by going to Image and then Reveal All. And that'll automatically adjust the size of the canvas to fit our image better. Okay, so as you can see, these definitely aren't perfectly aligned, so there's a little bit of work that we need to do. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do, is, in order to make the alignment a little bit easier, is I'm gonna change this top layer to a blending mode called Difference, just down here. And that gives us a really distinct uh, outline of where the misalignment is in the horizon. And we're just worried about how the horizon is lined up, because that'll be roughly where the stitch will happen. So in order to get these aligned better, I'm going to use the free transform tool. And you can get to that really quickly by going to edit and then free transform or pressing command T or control T on the keyboard. And now we have, uh, now we can sort of drag around the shape of our layer and uh, try to get everything lined up. Um, I like to move around this, this little uh, point in the center because that becomes our rotation point. So I'm going to move it here where it's roughly well, well aligned. And then I'm going to go ahead and just, just rotate it and try to get it right into place. It's looking pretty close. Maybe use the arrow keys just to get our alignment just slightly better. And then I can use and hold down control or command on the keyboard and just kind of skew the corners just to try and get the alignment a little bit better. Now we don't have to be completely perfect here. Uh, Photoshop will automatically kind of uh, adjust and tweak the line that it uses to stitch these together so we just want to get it relatively close. Okay I think that looks pretty good. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and reset that blending mode back to normal. So the quickest way to blend these two layers together seamlessly is to select both layers in the layers palette with a shift click and then we can go to edit and auto blend layers and we're obviously using a panorama blend and we want seamless tones and colors checked. And then we can click OK and Photoshop will automatically analyze the images and create a seamless transition between the two. All right, so now if we zoom out, you can see that we have our seamless composition and that's ready to be flattened and saved. So I'll go ahead and flatten my image into a single layer by going to this options dropdown in the layers palette and just selecting merge visible and that'll merge both visible layers together. Then we can go ahead and save our image. I'll just go to File and then Save. And then we should be able to return to Adobe Lightroom and see our final panorama. Now that our panorama is complete, we can go ahead and just do some quick basic edits on it. I'm just gonna enter the Develop module here. And the first thing that we probably wanna do is crop the image. So I'm gonna just drag in the frame of my image here using the Crop tool and just get rid of those white borders around the edge. 
All right, so now that we have our image cropped, we can do some basic edits. The first thing I like to do is uh, set the white balance. To do that really quickly, I like to pump up the vibrance and saturation all the way, and then I can make some small adjustments to the white balance. Start with a temperature, and I wanna basically find a good happy medium between having uh, some yellow tones and blue tones in the sky. And the same applies with uh, the pink and green tint. Uh, I want to find a good happy balance between the amount of green and pink visible in the sky. And that'll give us a relatively neutral sky. Once I have that set, I can go ahead and reset my vibrance and saturation back to zero by double clicking on their labels. And now we have a you know, very neutral looking astrophoto. Now this photo is pretty flat, it's a raw file, so we definitely want to do some more adjustments to try and give the image a little bit more pop. So the first thing I'm seeing is the foreground is really, really dark, so let's try to pull that up. I'm just gonna drag the shadow sliders up. And you can see that we have uh, a, a really strong pink tint. When I photographed this, it was on a very, very warm night, and so I had a lot of residual heat, and that caused a lot of extra noise in my foreground here. So one of the ways that I like to deal with that is just by using a graduated filter. And I can use this graduated filter tool and we're, we're gonna basically yeah, adjust the tint slider here um, kind of to the, the green side of the spectrum. And, uh, and then we're gonna reduce the saturation a little bit. And we'll just start with some arbitrary numbers right now. And we'll drag from the bottom up so that it covers the ground. And that makes our ground look a little bit more neutral, um, so we can continue on with some more of our edits. Continuing some adjustment on that graduated filter, uh, I, you know, I, I think it can definitely use a little less saturation to try and get rid of some of that pink, and we can definitely afford to adjust the tint more to the green side of the spectrum. I'm going to go ahead and leave that for now, and uh, let's move on to making some more edits to this photograph. One of the first major edits that I like to do is to adjust the tone curve for extra contrast in the image. So I'll, I'll first I'll pull up the right side of the graph here uh, in order to increase the brightness of the highlights. And then we can drag down the shadows again uh, by pulling down the left side of the graph here. And that'll just give our image significantly more contrast. Now as you can see, our sky is, is still way brighter than our ground. We can go back to that graduated filter tool and we can make a graduated filter that basically adjusts just the exposure and pulls the exposure down. So I'll pull it down just about one stop here and we'll drag from the top down and uh, kind of give it like a nice feathered edge here and then kind of adjust it a little bit so that it's just covering the sky. And this is a little bit strong of a graduated filter, probably won't go that strong. So I'll just adjust it a little bit here. And we can do a few more tweaks here that will just affect the sky um, I definitely think that some clarity can help to sort of pop the, the Milky Way out a little bit, give it a little bit more structure. And if you're de dealing with a little bit of light pollution, the dehaze tool can sort of reduce the effects of that light pollution. Some of those edits made my sky a little bit darker than I wanted, so I'm going to bring my exposure back up just a little bit. It's looking really good, I really like that. So go ahead and click Done. Image is looking pretty good overall. Um, but we probably do want to concentrate on some of the more detailed sections of the photograph. If we look at the sky, there's still a little bit of color noise left. Our stacking wasn't completely successful in getting rid of all the noise. We only use four, four uh, exposures anyway. So uh, we can go down to this detail slider here, and uh, we can use the color noise reduction slider and just kind of bring it up just about 25 to 30 percent, uh, and that'll reduce a lot of that color noise in the image and, and give it a, a much more clean, and, uh, and pleasant look. Okay, so now that we've got that cleaned up pretty good, the next thing that I wanna concentrate on is my foreground. If I zoom into my foreground right now, you can see that it has a ton of really bright, hot pixels. And this is something that you can expect on uh, extremely dark nights, especially warm uh, summer nights when shooting. And there's actually a fairly quick way to deal with that in Adobe Photoshop. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do one last step of noise reduction before we finish this tutorial. So I wanna open this image up in Adobe Photoshop. So I'll go ahead and just right click it here and go to edit in and edit in Photoshop. And since we made all of those adjustments in Lightroom, I'm gonna go ahead and select this edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments and click edit. And Lightroom will export a copy of that image with all the adjustments that we've already made to it. 
So let's take a closer look in Photoshop again real quick. You can see that we have all this peppery grain in our foreground, so let's go ahead and do some adjustments to fix that. So since we're only concerned with editing the foreground, the first thing that we want to do in Adobe Photoshop is to uh, carefully select the foreground. And a really, really quick way to do that um, is to use this quick selection tool. So if we select that, and we use a relatively large brush, I'm using a brush uh, that's 500 pixels in size. And then if we just sort of start dragging over the foreground, you can see that Photoshop automatically selects the horizon really, really carefully. Uh, this is an excellent selection tool. It usually works really well on photographs like this, especially where you have a stark contrast between the foreground and the sky. Okay, so now that I have that selected, we can reduce the noise in the foreground by going to Filter, and then Noise, and Dust and Scratches. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just click on an area of the image here that has some detail, and, uh, and then I'm going to reset both of these numbers, the radius and the threshold, all, way, all the way down to their minimum levels. So at the minimum setting of 1 pixels for the radius, you can still see that there are some hot pixels visible. So we can go ahead and just increase that to 2. And you can see that a radius of 2 pretty much eliminates most of the hot pixels in the foreground. Uh, but it does kind of give it this sort of blurry, painterly look. So we want to compensate for that by increasing the threshold on the image. And we want to just bring it up to a point where it brings back more of the fine detail uh, without making all of those hot pixels visible again. Um, so it, it does make it slightly more noisy, but we want just sort of like a natural looking grain uh, without all, all of those really, really bright hot pixels. And I'm starting to, to like the look of about, about 30. If I disable the preview here just to give you an idea of the improvement that that makes, you can see that it's, it's pretty, pretty drastic. It gets rid of all of those really, really bright pixels. We can start to see some of the detail uh, in the foreground really well. You can see the structure of the rocks in the foreground there, and it just looks like a much cleaner image that way. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I'll click OK, and that's looking like a really clean photograph. Uh, I'm really, really happy with those results. So I can go ahead and click File and Save. Okay, so here's an example of our completed stacked panorama. Uh, so it took four exposures in each position of our panorama, and that gave us a lot of noise reduction, especially in the sky. And uh, we did a little bit of noise reduction on the foreground, but overall, looking at this image, you know, as a whole, it's just really, really clean. All of my exposures were shot on a Sony A7S, which is only a 12 megapixel sensor. Our final image size is something more like 40 or 50 megapixels. So we went from 12 megapixels up to 50 megapixels uh, just by stitching together uh, 10 positions on a panorama. So if you were using this technique on a camera that had even more megapixels, like say a Canon 5DSR, which has 50 megapixels to begin with, it'd be really easy to make a photograph that has 200 or even 300 megapixels in it just by being able to combine these exposures together with a stacked panorama. All right, that's it for now. Once again, I'm Ian Norman from Lonely Spec. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you want to see some more astrophotography videos in the future, please subscribe and check out all of our astrophotography gear reviews, tutorials, and inspiration on LonelySpec.com. See ya!